Hello, mentors. Welcome to our podcast series, Mentorships in Education, brought to you by Just Education at JustEducationFirst.com. I am your host, Judy Epstein. I am very excited about the wide range of experts who have volunteered to give up their time and expertise. They will share their innovative ideas, their exciting perspectives, their rich resources, and their research with us. Please continue to delve into these topics on their websites and with your legal counsel, healthcare provider, and education professional. Our guests will have information that will be relevant to mentors supporting struggling students, parents, teachers, administrators, legal support, and health professionals. We will address all levels of education with issues that affect academic performance. Our goal is to open discussions and introduce a variety of approaches to those searching for information in a free venue. So mentors, let me introduce our guest for today. Welcome mentors to our podcast, Mentorships in Education, sponsored by Just Education First at JustEducationFirst.com. Please go to our website to follow the blog and to check out the other guests who have so willingly shared so much information with us. We'd love to have you subscribe so you don't miss anything. Please feel free to leave a comment. And I want to get right into our new guest today. I'm very excited to speak with Maureen Brown. We had a wonderful conversation uh, a little while ago and she has some really interesting uh, information to share with parents and teachers and administrators as well, because we're going to go into some topics that will connect everyone together. Hello, Maureen. Thank you for Hi. being with us today. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. Thank you for asking me. Thank you. Uh, before we get into speaking uh, together, I want to tell our mentors a little bit about you. You are from the Boston, Massachusetts area. You are the owner of Advocacy for Special Kids. It's an LLC. You've worked together in this field for over 20 years, primarily in special education and in advocacy-connected endeavors. You've been a trainer and a consultant uh, working with victims of violence and children who are on the spectrum. You have a Master of Science in Human Services. You majored in psychology. You are licensed in college counseling. You trained with Ross Green in collaborative, proactive solutions. And I have to just say that I also trained with Ross Green when he used to be called a collaborative problem solving. So we have that in common. He's an amazing uh, facilitator and has done some wonderful work with struggling students, both in lockup and with parents and, and teachers in education. You've done advanced studies at Suffolk University in law school for critical developments in special education law. And there are many other things that you have done. I don't want to take up a, a lot of time to go over those things because you have many, many accomplishments that are very exciting. Um, I know that if people would like to follow you and see more about you, they can find you on LinkedIn under Advocacies for Special Kids. They can find you on Facebook. And they can find you on Maureen Brown Advocacy for Special Kids if they were to Google you. The name says a great deal about what you do. But one of the things that I find that interests me and that I'm often asked about is how did you get started um, in the field? Um, what made you think there was a need for an advocacy for special kids business? Uh, you know, what was your aha moment, I like to say, that led you in this direction? Well, I feel like um, you kind of mentioned um, the victims of violent crime. I started in my junior year of college when I was studying psychology, working um, for a district attorney's office as a victim witness advocate. And in that role, I was working with um, predominantly um, young victims of abuse that were having to testify. And um, so I felt like in that role, it started me in that kind of advocacy position, you know, really kind of advocating for their rights, what they needed when they had to testify. Um, and it wasn't until 
um, years later, my own son was born um, premature. And I felt like right at the beginning in the hospital, there was a number of things that I, I just felt like I had to be advocating for, like, you know, what does it look like to get services through early intervention? And it, even like in the hospital, because he was in the NICU for two months, wow, advocating for his rights while he was in the hospital, which you would think, you know, it starts that process like, you know what? I have to kind of question authority in the sense of, no, that doesn't seem right. You know, I want to get another opinion. And that just started me on my journey from early on. Um, I can recall, you know, a lot of people kind of discounting the fact, oh, no, he's fine. He's fine. And I was saying, you know, he wasn't meeting his um, kind of those critical developments at the stages that I thought he right. was. I was one of those obsessive readers. What do you expect when you're pregnant? And then Absolutely. what do you expect in the first few months? And um, I remember even having to advocate with his pediatrician who was saying, no, I think he's fine. And questioning that and trying to get another opinion to start early intervention. Um, at that point, I had kind of left my job um, doing advocacy um, in the state capacity, working for the state. And I stayed home for a little bit and, you know, obviously taking care of him. And then I realized when we were trying to get into the public preschool that I was having a lot of pushback. I was being told things like, you know, you have to meet this criteria to get one of our spots. And it just sent me into <laughs> kind of this need to do a tremendous amount of research. It wasn't that I was getting angry. It was more like, let me just find out what my rights are and what my, you know, what my son is entitled to. So from where I started in that first kind of IEP meeting to where I am now, I just, um, I've always had a passion to empower families, parents, and just make sure they, they know what they need to know when going into this process. Because I do think it's challenging enough to have a child with special needs, but then to put on top of it, now you know, have to know the law. You have to know the, uh, you know, the ins and outs of um, you know, what to expect, what, what services are available. So it just sent me into starting to... Um, do some research on my own, but I also went into a program through, uh, there's an agency in Boston. Most states do have them. The one in Boston is called the Federation for Children with Special Needs. Okay. And it's a certification that you do get. And it's kind of all of the information that you would need to be a, um, you know, a train, um, an advocate. And I went through that and realized, you know, I still need some kind of, um, information. I do, I do still need a lot of, um, you know, info on the law and stuff. So I started taking um, rights law trainings, and then um, also the advanced legal training at Suffolk Law School. And so that was in the past, uh, that was in the first couple of years um, to kind of get the training that I, I felt like I needed to help and assist parents, because there's actually no real certification that's acknowledged um, within the country for oh. special education advocates up to this point. There's been some legislation and push to try to have it have more of a certification, but that hasn't happened up to this point. So that was really it. My own child um, being born premature and just shifting from um, advocacy within the court system to advocacy within the special education world. You were very fortunate that you had the time and the motivation, yes. and the wherewithal to be able to do all that due diligence that you needed to do in order to support your child. Um, I, you know, moving into uh, parents uh, who have children with special needs, um, many of us uh, don't have that time to devote, and we're very dependent on the people who tell us they're an authority um, and give us information. Uh, and we, we, I get that old, you know, what, what happens when you assume? We assume, you know, that they're giving us um, accurate information and, and good feedback on what our child needs. That old quote, um, you know, you say you want parents to know what they need to know. And just to play on that for a minute, there's a there's a, a quote that I um, used to tell my students is you don't know 
what you don't know. Exactly. And, you know, you're being there to give parents a, an objective perspective of what's, what's going on um, without any, we like to think that educators have an objective uh, perspective on what our child needs, but the reality is that um, there are financial issues connected with that, um, primarily financial as well as um, uh, uh, personal, I guess, issues connected with their perspective, and it's not always so objective. Right. Uh, um, you mentioned it at, at one time when we were talking, and I think I also read somewhere in this in this vein about how you like to keep parents informed uh, about what it is their child needs. You said one of your your one of your um, goals, one of your uh, primary uh, uh, attempts, is to put together a team that supports the student. If for some reason you feel that you personally don't have that information, can you talk a little bit about this team, what the profile of a team would look like, who might be included on the team? Yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like I will be the spokesperson for the parents' team. So um, usually I start them with encouraging them to get something called a neuropsychological evaluation. I've worked with um, many really credible neuropsychs over the years, and <clears throat> I'm very familiar with the reports, and I pretty much know what I'm looking for in terms of a very descriptive um, summary of who the child is, what their learning profile you know, looks like, what are their kind of like, what, what are the test scores, um, where are their strengths, where are their weaknesses, and more importantly, what do they recommend for this child? So that's like a, a good place to start. Um, and it has to be really a credible neuropsychologist. And when I say credible, it has to be someone that stands by the report and also is willing to, you know, participate in something like a team meeting. If there's questions about the report, maybe they'll conference in and if, if team members have questions. But also if things don't, you know, go well, and they need to take it to another level, whether it be mediation or um, a hearing, that they would be willing to testify. Um, other members of a team are really dependent on, um, say, a diagnosis. When we have a student with autism, we have a lot of, we'll have like home-based uh, behavioral consultants. We, so we'll have like a board-certified yeah. behavior analyst from home. We'll have one at school. Then we might have speech, OT, physical therapy. Like, so we just wow. have a lot of players sitting around the table. And, um, you know, it, it's a big team. And I tend to take the role of like, okay, let me compile all this information, you know, present it to the school team if we have a neuropsych, and then try to get it incorporated into an IEP. It's, it's filtering information almost through like one source. But I'm just gathering that information. I feel like their expert is really their neuropsychologist. Or, you know, if it's a, say if it's a student with severe anxiety, maybe it's their psychiatrist. Maybe it's, you know, wh whoever it might be that kind of takes that lead. But I'm guided by what they're recommending for the child. And then just advocating, you know, strongly right. to the school that this is what the child needs. I'm, I'm curious, Maureen, um, if you recommend to parents, and I, and I realize you're speaking from the perspective of Massachusetts, that your yeah. answers may not uh, apply to other states, but certainly anyone listening would be able to investigate uh, yeah. whether or not that's applicable for them or how it might configure for them. But if you were felt were recommending to a parent that they get a neuropsych evaluation here in Massachusetts. Um, would the parent be required to pay for that or is that paid for by the school district? Um, typically, there's a couple of different ways. Sometimes parents will just go and they'll, um, they'll contact their insurance company and the insurance company will pay a portion of it. They used to cover the entire cost. So that would oh. include the neuropsychological perspective, which is kind of um, 
interviews, maybe observations of the child, but there's also an educational piece. So insurance companies started taking the perspective of let the local school district um, cover the cost of the education piece, we'll cover the neural psych. Right. So typically it will run from anywhere, you know, the standard is around 1200 could go up to like 3600 Wow. I know um, they take a long time. Well, depending. Um, oh, all right. I was told they can take hours, not Oh, acting. just in terms of the actual testing. Yes. A lot yes. of times um, agencies, neuropsychologists will break their testing into two days. Oh. So it'll be like... Uh, Actually, one session is uh, fact gathering from the parents. Then they'll have two separate testing sessions, maybe two and a half hours, three hours on one day, same thing the other day. Okay. Then there'll be a feedback going over the testing results with the parents. And then maybe eight weeks later, we'll get a report. Oh, wow. So it is kind of a long process. Right. Um, sometimes when a school district does a psychological, which is usually what they do to determine eligibility, um, for something called a core evaluation. If I, if we tend to disagree with that, sometimes I've had school districts pay saying, we didn't think it was comprehensive enough and I may get them to pay for a neuropsychological evaluation. Oh. It's just that it will be, um, they'll say if they're in agreement, they'll agree to it, but parents have to go to a place that accepts the state, um, rate so typically that's like hospitals um some clinics some independent neuropsychologists will take it um and then that tends to lead us into oh there's more of a wait list because there's, there's more of a demand to try to you know um get on those lists because a lot of people are looking to have that kind of paid for either through mass health or at that rate setting okay I, I didn't want to interrupt you, and I and I th that's really good information. Uh, if a, a parent um, is working with a school district that is not as willing to uh, uh, work with them, if they then go and talk to them and say they're not comfortable with uh, some of the testing that's been done at the school. Would you recommend that they get a lawyer? Would you recommend that they get an advocate first? What, what would be their steps, the steps you um, feel they should do? You know, I mean, if they were savvy, they could, you know, get on and kind of Google what to do in terms of independent educational evaluation. One really good website is um, that rights law that I was telling you about. Um, What's it they, called? Uh, rights law. Vice. Uh, with a W. W-R-I-G-H-T-S law. I can send you that link too, so you can include it All right. uh, yes, for uh, your uh, students. Let me do that. So, um, the mentors who are looking for, for information or for um, a, re a, a resource, they might want yes. to sit in that. They, He's really good. He has draft letters, sample letters for parents to um, write to the school district specifically about different things like um, how do I request a core evaluation when I suspect my child has a disability and he'll do form letters and things like that um, for parents. But one of the things I do encourage parents is to, if you're feeling like you got a report back and you just, you're not in agreement with it or you didn't feel like it was comprehensive, um, in every, every state, this is a, um, IDEA law, uh -huh. you can, uh, request an independent educational evaluation in any of the areas that the school district evaluated in. Um, and the way it works is they either agree to pay for the evaluation within five days, they have to either file for a hearing or they, they are obligated to pay for the independent educational eval. So that could be in any area, occupational therapy, speech and language. Um, I've had um, things, functional behavioral assessments, an independent person to do that, assistive technology. So any of the areas that they've evaluated in, you just have to let them do their own evaluation first. And if you're not in agreement, then you can disagree and say, we want our own um, evaluation. They're also supposed to provide you with a list of the providers that do take the rate setting. Um, 
Maureen, so is, this, is this a federal yes, law? Yes, it is. It's a federal law. Okay. Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. So it, it's probably applicable in other states. Right. And um, I think we had talked about it previously. Yes. Um, that for Massachusetts, it has to be within 16 months. Um, I think that the federal regs say there's no time limit. Okay. So the, the parents don't have to get concerned that, you know what, that was last year. And, you know, you just check the, the time frames of your state. But like I said, right. Massachusetts was, is 16 months. But I've said, well, we're going, we're requesting it under the federal regulations. That was two years ago. However, we want an, we want an independent eval. Um, we, we're, we're talking in, in general terms a little bit. Let, yes. Let me get you into some specifics. I know that you, when you threw some terms out at me when we spoke, and I told you I was uh, quickly trying to write everything down, and you, you, you said to me that some of the issues that you deal with are genetically based, language based, cognitively based. Can you um, be more specific about those areas? So maybe some of our, our mentors who are listening, parents in particular, might be able to say, oh, that's my child. You know, I didn't realize that maybe I should be looking into um, getting some special services. How, what, what areas are you working with, with parents and students? Yeah. You listed a few of them. It really, I take all cases in terms of the only <laughs> thing I, um, you know, let parents know is it has to be a documented disability. Um, so say it is something like Fragile X or genetic type disability. Sometimes when we look at the educational categories, that may fall under global, you know, intellectual impairment something like that. And, and so it really depends on what the child needs. So if we're dealing with, um, say a student, maybe that does have some uh, genetic issues, whether it be fragile X or, you know, whatever it might be, uh -huh. but yet um, maybe they have a high IQ. Like, I'm just trying to think in terms of like, I yeah. would take a look at their profile and then say, for an example, if they needed um, speech and language, they didn't have a means to communicate. Maybe they, um, their, their vision was somewhat impaired. Uh, you know, like it really runs the gamut. I would be in a position to say, okay, do we need something called orientation and mobility so your child can safely access the school? That they can, you know, make their way safely around the playground. Um, do they need something called like a teacher of the visual impaired? Uh, maybe they can't see uh, print in the way that, you know, typically other students would. Um, do they need augmentative communication? Maybe they need a device that helps support their language. So really it just depends. I feel like I'm kind of the one that would brainstorm giving parents, you know, some options. Typically, the things that I mention, many parents are like, I had no idea that we were even, we could access that. We could get those <laughs> services in school. You right. know, um, you know, I kind of joked with you before, like I do work with a lot of young students with autism. And many times when they're in early intervention, parents will say, gosh, you know, my child really responds to music. And, you know, music therapy is another um, can be a form of a related service that I've had written into many IEPs and parents thought, wow, I had no idea. And um, I didn't either. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, there is this, um, kind of evaluation that has to be done that with, with the support of music, does that help the, the student access the curriculum more, you know? So it's like before and after the music. So, um, that's like another service that parents just wouldn't know about and that it's a certified music therapist that would come in and perform that type of service to the student. Um, so it's really just getting a sense of like, tell me what the needs are and then let me tell you how we can go out, you know, like really address those needs uh, educationally. When you're working with school districts, you just threw out a, a, quite an extensive menu of options there. Right. Um, and I'm wondering how some of these suggestions are 
uh, received by some of the school districts because, as I said before, um, some people involved in the team meeting, with um, not without without malicious intent, but certainly they're interested in how what their budget is and how this is going to impact their budget. How, what kind of responses do you get from uh, members of the team who are representing the school district? when you bring, bring up some of these suggestions? I tend to get a lot of pushback. And, <laughs> you know, I will just say, well, we're requesting this evaluation. So you have an obligation to respond and respond within five days. If you're not going to, you know, do that evaluation, we, we would need to know why. Why are you, you know, denying the request for this evaluation? Um, typically, I mean, I try to work collaboratively with teams. I try to present it in a way it's like, listen, you can't be the be all end all to this child. We need, again, building a team around, you know, supporting this child. I was in a meeting yesterday where we really needed an augmentative communication specialist. The speech and language pathologist was trying to take on a huge role, but yet she was one person and she was working on articulation and formulation of sounds, but the child also has a device she was trying to program the device. And I'm just saying, like, let me help you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They, have a con they had a consultant. I'm saying, bring the consultant in. Let's have more people because this is a very complex child. And so, you know, it's, they, they might be getting kind of a little pushback from, you know, the higher ups. But at the level that we are, sometimes at the team level, I'm saying, let me help you. <laughs> Just, you know, do you think that this child needs this? And that's all I'm asking. Okay, well, what does that look like? And um, so sometimes it's pushback, but if I explain to them really what I'm looking for, I feel like I can kind of get them to come around. Certainly your first, first uh, words out of your mouth wouldn't be lawyer, but I'm wondering if, you know, how often or, or under what circumstances you might feel the need to get some legal representative to be part of this team. Really, the only time I feel like I get to the level of making a referral to the attorney that I do work with is when a child is really requiring another placement. That's usually the, the biggest uh, oh. reason for that referral. So we get, I, I have a lot of um, dyslexic, t you know, specific learning right. disabilities, students with dyslexia. And many times school districts just can't put together an appropriate program for, say, a child that's reading three, four, sometimes five grade levels below where oh, they should okay. be. Right. And their solution might be, well, we have a partial language-based program. And, you know, I, I, I say, like, well, if a student is reading four grade levels below, how do you then put them in an inclusion class where it's at grade level and that they just have to keep up? Those cases sometimes, they require more of a substantially separate program where all of that information is presented at a slower pace and at their level. Um, if, yeah, so if, if the school district um, uh, can't provide the services that the child needs in order to be able to stay in the public school, do they, are they then responsible in Massachusetts? I don't know if anywhere else, but in Massachusetts, are they responsible for any of the financial, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities to put this child into a private school? Yeah, so that's a lot of. Um, the work that I do is really building a case that, you know, um, is the student making effective progress? And the way I typically present that case is through, say, testing, neuropsychs. And, you know, when we compare apples to apples on, say, testing, you look at where a student was maybe last year or two years ago, where they are now. And if they're not making documented growth, then that starts to prove a case saying, you know, you're providing specialized instruction, but yet the child isn't moving. They're not making progress. So that would be basically the case that's presented to a hearing officer. And I think we had talked about it before. If a case mm -hmm. goes to hearing and, you know, the parents prevail, um, they, they, 
are entitled to their attorney fees back and um, many school districts will kind of resolve issues before, you know, they get to a hearing because knowing that they, they would have to pay um, their attorney okay. fees for their school, okay. right. the attorney fees, you know, for the parents and then the private placement and then transportation. It's very costly for our school districts. A lot of parents may not be aware of that and therefore reticent to even pursue uh, looking into uh, that as an option. So it right. probably kind of changes their perspective a little bit to get an opinion about whether they do have a strong case for, uh, you know, for that option if they're having difficulty in public school. I'm wondering, um, Maureen, I know that, you know, young, that you work with children that are very young, um, probably preschool, you know, on up. But if a student is old enough to be able to participate in some of these decisions, um, you know, I don't know, maybe fourth, fifth, sixth grade up through, you know, high school or college, um, do you encourage them to be part of the process? Yeah, so now um, looking at, for Massachusetts, um, students are st start to be invited to their meetings. It used to be 16, now it's 14. Mm -hmm. And um, I really leave it up to the parents in terms of how do they feel about it. Um, some school districts really push for that student to be in the meeting. And, um, you know, we're talking about sometimes there's a really big team sitting around. It's difficult for any 14-year-olds. But I have some students that are like, absolutely. And I love when students come in and they can kind of advocate for themselves. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's parents and you know their advocate and a school district sitting around saying this is what the child needs no this is what it you know this is what they need and all of a sudden the, the student comes in and says listen this is what i need and it's oh, wow. just it's great it's it's, it's 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 that's when i feel like it really successfully works and um if a student does want to come in sometimes i'll prep them a little bit in advance and um that's when transition planning really is supposed to start at 14 you know, taking the perspective of what does this child want? Do they want to go on to further education? Are they looking to work right after high school? So that's why, you know, they start to invite students in Massachusetts right at 14, like kind of at the beginning of high school. What if a student that's younger than 14, say, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade says that they want to be able to come in, are they permitted to participate? They could definitely come in. Um, usually maybe a team chair would say, why don't you come in for a portion of it? I mean, okay. I, I, I don't, it's not that common that a student would come in under 14. Um, but I mean, I have seen it happen. Okay. All right. I was just wondering how that um, translated into uh, whether or not they would be permitted, whether right. they were allowed into the, pro into the process. Um, it, with some of the parents who are listening to what you have to say and, and some of the uh, focus uh, areas that you have in working with uh, the school districts, if they do not have an advocate at this point, if they are in dialogue with the school districts to develop a, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but a, a, a plan of some kind for their child choosing what kind of a plan they're going to have. And there seems to be some disagreement as to what their, um, what the school district wants to do, what the parent wants to do. The parent is not as well informed. What are some questions that you feel that might behoove the parents to at least ask about even if they, so that they then can go and do a little research on their own before they sign these plans if they're not happy or uh, acquiesce to what the school district is telling them. Well, every single state has their own parent agency. I mentioned the one in Massachusetts being mm -hmm. uh, the Federation for Children with Special Needs. So right. after um, you go through the advocate training, you also have to do, for Massachusetts, a certain amount of volunteer hours. And um, I would recommend that parents reach out to the agency in their state and try to get some guidance or you know, advice and um, usually you can get pointed in, a right in the right direction from there. Um, many times they might have free advocates and um, people that can assist. And if they, don't, if they don't kind of know what the answer is, usually, as I said, they can make referrals to other agencies or 
guide them in that, in that way. And a lot of times too, like there's, um, something called, um, every school district is obligated to have a, um, advisory council. It's just, it's part of the law, like a parent special needs advisory council. Um, so parents could contact the, the, um, the agency within their school district. And sometimes other parents are willing to share and, and kind of support or guide them in the right direction as well. It's called like a parent advisory council, PAC. Okay, all right. Uh, I was talking to a parent yesterday and told them that I was going to be speaking with you, uh, that we were going to be doing a conversation together. She asked me to ask you a question. Okay. So um, she is. Uh, she has been told that her child with ADHD, who is in high school, um, is not eligible for an IEP, and they are uh, offering to put her child on a 504. And could you talk a little bit about how uh, what the, the what the in Massachusetts, of course. Um, how it is determined whether a child is eligible for an IEP, when they might be put on a 504. Um, I'm not familiar with, a, I've never had a child uh, with diagnosed with ADHD on a, an IEP. I'm not sure if that's common or uncommon. Um, if, does, does the child have, is, does it have to be a, a morbid situation where they have other diagnoses in order to be on an IEP. Could you kind of address that? Because she was asking me questions that I could not answer her. Yeah. So, I mean, I, this actually just happened to me the other day. So I have had students with just ADHD that are on IEPs because as we go through the flow chart, the disability is typically categorized under other health impairment. And then we kind of go down the flow chart, the flow chart and um, does the student, um, are they, do, do they require one or more related services? Do they require specially designed instruction? Um, are they making effective progress? Um, so as we go down that flow chart, um, really the difference between the IEP and the 504 is the specially designed instruction. Um, I've had kids on both IEPs, 504s for um, ADHD. It really, it, it, it depends. So maybe they require something like um, behavioral support. And I would argue that that's something different than what, you know, students in general ed are getting. Maybe they require um, some specially designed instruction for executive functioning. You know, that like frontal mm -hmm. lobe where they're just so kind of dysregulated and, and they really need help with organization. So it's that specially designed instruction. Um, you know, the 504, it's, it's a federal civil rights law, um, and it's to help just stop discrimination against people with disabilities. So the criteria for that is a child that has a disability, um, and it could in involve um, learning or attentional issues, and the disability has to interfere with the child's ability to learn in a general education classroom, um, interferes one or more like life functions. Um, so, you know, a 504 may be appropriate for that child because it, it might just be accommodations and modifications that they need, like sitting close to the teacher, um, a cue, cueing back to task, maybe reiterating, um, you know, when there's a new concept to come up, you know, really keeping the, the child yeah on focus right. you know um okay. it really depends but i've seen them on both i don't say as a general statement that a child can't be on an iep uh with adhd because i've <laughs> i've seen those developed as well it really depends on what are the behaviors how are they presenting and what are their needs okay i i hope she's listening going to be listening to this because i think you kind of clarified it for her um and i will uh, pass this on to her um is there any information that we haven't covered before we get more into something else um that you would want to make sure that parents are aware of that when they're listening to a team 
speaking about their child, that they are aware that they're covering uh, specific areas that sometimes are not addressed, um, perhaps covering areas that they're, that they're not covering appropriately. How would you, uh, and I know that you gave me the name of the agency, but is there something that comes to mind that you know is very often overlooked at these team meetings? Um, I, I know this is so basic, but I, I, I learned early on, and I, I also remember uh, Pete Wright from Wright's Law saying, if it's not in writing, it was never said. <laughs> I just, I'll never forget that because I've uh -huh. had situations where, even for my own son, I remember a service was agreed to in a team meeting and um, it wasn't what? in the team notes. It was for a paraprofessional. And um, after when I got the IEP back, it was like, I don't know what you're talking about. That was never said. It was, it was like the most insane thing that I've ever experienced. I'm like, there was 20 people in the room. What do you mean? So I just make it a point to never, ever, ever leave a team meeting without a summary of notes and don't leave before you check them with the key points of things that were agreed to and that were discussed at that meeting. Um, what a great quote. That's a great quote and probably the best, best advice you could give them. Oh, because you leave meetings and time and time again, it's like, no, no, we never agreed to that. So it really doesn't matter what I write down in my own notes. I would encourage parents to just really listen and make sure that there is a team member there taking notes. And when they say like, oh, I, you know, I just, I'm gonna have to rewrite these notes and give them back to you. I'll just say at the beginning of the team meeting, I'm gonna be looking for the notes. So make sure we're gonna get a copy at the end. And they're supposed to basically provide you with a summary of what was agreed to, and particularly if it's um, additional services, usually it's in the form of a service delivery grid. And they'll ask the parents to sign that they received a copy of those notes. But hmm. don't leave until you make sure everything is in those notes, because that's basically an agreement. Yes, this is what we're agreeing to. It's like a receipt. Yes. So then when you get the IEP and it's not on there, then you can go back and say, no, 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 you agreed to this. Here's your notes. And that it can be rectified in that way. If the parents then had a problem and tried to resolve it, say, at the D Department of Education, the first thing that they'll say is, what did the notes say? If it wasn't in writing, it's just right. it, you have really no recourse. I, I know I that seems that. simple and somewhat adversarial, no. but I feel like it's so important. Sometimes simple is the most important. <laughs> yeah. I, know, uh, I know you touched a little bit on when a student might be on an IEP versus a 504, what some of that, um, what some of the distinctions are. Um, but are there any legal distinctions in Massachusetts between an IEP and a 504? Yeah, so an IEP is covered, the, the law is the Individuals with Disability Education Act. It's a federal special education law for students with disability. Um, so if there was, say, a problem or a compliance issue, um, parents would first go to um, something called Program Quality Assurance, but it would be the Department of Education that oversees, um, you know, the, the regulations. Um, so if there is a an issue, that's who you would go to. For the 504, uh, it's a 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This is a federal civil, life, civil rights law. It's oh. just stop discrimination against people with disabilities. Uh -huh. So when there's a complaint that you have um, for a 504, you would go to the Office of Civil Rights. So that's the agency that oversees um, 504, and you would file a complaint through them. Okay, uh, I had another question from a parent. Mm -hmm. um, well, it wasn't really a question, it was a discussion that we had because there, we had a little difference of opinion. And um, because you addressed this, and I don't remember if it was when we were talking or something I read on one of your websites, but you talked about uh, labeling students and one, and this parent said to me, oh, no, I'm not going to put my child on an IEP, even though 
he qualifies because I don't want it in his record that he's being labeled as having um, some issues. So I'm wondering what your feeling is about that. How, how would you, you know, have, what kind of a discussion would you have with a parent that, that presented that perspective to you? I guess I would want more information in terms of, so is it that, for an example, if, if there was a child that had a reading disability and they didn't feel like the reading services were adequate, I know you're talking mm -hmm. about kind of confidentiality that yeah, I can, I'm not able gonna, to know. I don't want to give you any more information. Oh, no, no, no. I'm saying um, yeah. that she didn't want the school district to know or oh. that she was, or mm -hmm. that their child was being labeled. So what I would mm -hmm. ask is, so are you going to get those services on your own? Are you going to pay for those outside? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think it's worth um, not getting the child the services that they require. And, and this information is confidential. So I would kind of right. say like, who was, she, who was she afraid to find out? I mean, this is part of their educational <laughs> file. And I would want to know, are you looking for the school to, to provide certain services, accommodations, modifications, or is it just, I don't know, is the parent embarrassed? Or I, I'm just, I think in this case, it had to do with following the child through school and into college. I think that. okay, but it's not something that you have to report mm -hmm. um, that the, a child receives services. That's something that th it's up to the discretion of the parent or the student to disclose that information. So it's not just readily available that an IEP would be disclosed and would go on an application. the The parent would have to make that decision to disclose that. So a lot of students they might have an IEP and say, "That's it. I'm going to college without any supports." Um, so, you know, I just, I always feel like if the child requires services and they're, you know, entitled to an IEP, I'd just be kind of questioning a little bit more. Why would we want, not want to provide them with what they're entitled to or, or what they need? Okay. All right. I, I'm, um, you, in reading, you know, I mentioned to you in, in, in your background, in your bio, that, um, you did some training with Ross Green. Yes. And I'm wondering how you've incorporated that training into some of the work you've done with parents and kids. So I just, I, I think we had talked about it before. I loved his approach of trying to include the child uh -huh. in some of the, the problem solving. And, um, you know, I remember early on using that theory of like the baskets. What do we have to do? <laughs> what do we like? What can we negotiate a little bit and what can we kind of throw out the window? And I think about that piece of um, taking a real stringent black and white. This is this has to be done, you know, a behavioral approach for some kids that are very inflexible. Right. So I try to get teams to think about um, things other than it's this way or, you know, because this is our school policy. I think you have to really say, but why? Why do we have to make it? that it's for every single student, they have to do this, like line up. And, you know, this is the way it's going to be. I'm like, but what if this kid is having these sensory issues? What if the loud noises? What if, you know what I mean? So thinking outside the box a little bit. And, um, and I, I think I used an example. I remember I had a team meeting and all of the parents and, or the team members were talking about, there's a student, he's walking around the playground, he's isolating. And we have to include him. Let's include him in all the team activities. And we were strategizing ways to include him. And I remember somebody asking the student, would you want to be involved in the, in the activities of recess? And he said, no, it's the only time that I have some time to myself. And I, I really appreciate just thinking. And I walk the parameter of the um, playground. And that's what I really need to do. So we incorporated what he needed into a plan where sometimes he'd play, but other times he really needed that downtime. I always think it's important to ask the child and let's collaborate together, not the adults are in charge and you're going to do it because I said so. That's kind of what I got out of his training and I, I loved it. I think it's, it's amazing the work he does. Yeah, he is pretty amazing. I really um, used him a lot with the kids that I worked with. Um, you... Uh, there's a quote of yours that I found when I was doing some reading, a uh, quote of yours and one um, I'd like, I'm going to read it to you. 
and I'd like you to spend a few minutes kind of talking about it a little bit. Um, it says, and I quote, nonverbal does not mean I don't have anything to say. It means you will have to listen to me with more than just your ears. I love that. Can you tell me where that came from? Um, is it your quote? Um, is, does it apply to kids in general sometimes? Uh, I, were you speaking of a particular population of students? Um, I, do you of remember? course, I, I, I do remember. I just don't, I don't have the person that wrote it. I could probably get that for you. I remember posting it on my, um, on one of my pages, but why did you post it though? What resonated with you? Well, I mean, I, I, I had one of my first clients who's now 19 has been nonverbal her entire life mm. and she does use, wow. uh, a communication device, but she also just communicates through so many different means. You know, she just laughs all the time and she loves her music and she just, there's so many different ways to be able to communicate with her, but you're right. Adults or people around her have to be very kind of patient. Um, not only kind of wait for her to uh, speak to you on her device, but also just like looking at her in terms of knowing what she wants, what she needs. And I think we all communicate in different ways. You know, that so much is said by nonverbal language. And, um, and I just, I think every single child that I work with, whether they're verbal or nonverbal, they have a way to, you know, they have to have a way to communicate. And, and we just have to take the, the time and the opportunity to listen. 